Uh, in the letter I wrote last time, I made a statement that I would try to give you the key to maintaining a constant happiness so that you don't nosedive. I was aware that several individuals were diving and not coming up, <clears throat> which I guess is one of the reasons why I didn't get here. You see, when you're down and you think, oh, things are terrible and you're frantic, I couldn't communicate with you very easily. Also, if I came here and you got this lift and got out of it, <clears throat> you would say that I did it, which develops a dependence, dependency relationship, which isn't good. You're infinite. You can do anything and everything you want. You can have, be, or do whatever you will or desire. And when the disturbance lasts long enough, you get fed up with it and you let it go anyway. Then you do it, see, and it's much, much better when you do it and you don't need someone else to lean upon. But I kind of felt that what the group would like to know at that time was how to maintain this happiness. Why don't we have it all the time? We should. And so I thought I'd try to give you the understanding or the key to the understanding that'll help you develop happiness that, that lasts. All right, now this is the key. When you understand or when you know what happiness is, then you're able to establish happiness more and more until it's all the time. But the key is knowing what is this thing, happiness. When you know what it is, you look for it where it is, rather than look for it where it isn't. Looking for happiness where it isn't is what gives you misery. Looking for happiness where it isn't is what causes you to nosedive. Is there any question on that, what I've said so far? The key is knowing what happiness is so that you can go directly for it. Not recognizing what happiness is makes it difficult to establish it permanently. What is happiness? Well, to most people, they call it pleasure. And what it actually is, is escape from pain. What most people call happiness to, today is they're getting away from their pain, escape, entertainment. They cannot stand being with themselves, with their own thoughts. They have to run to a movie, a nightclub, to visit someone just to get some action going so that they are not alone with their own thoughts. When their mind is taken away from their own thoughts, they feel better and they call that happiness. All entertainment is actually that. Although when you become free, you can enjoy entertainment uh, far more than before, but you need none of it because you're happy. Now the happiness I'm going to talk about is not the escape from misery kind of happiness. It's the joy that results from being your real self. The more we are our real self, the more joyous we feel.
Now this joy is accomplished not by the thing or the person out there whom we associate with the joy, but it's accomplished by satisfying the desire for or the thoughts wanting to acquire this person or thing. We quiet those thoughts. And the quieter the mind is, the more the self can shine forth. But this is something you've got to see in your own mind, that the quieter you get your mind, the more joyous you are, the happier you are. It's good to play with this, experiment with it until you see it, that whatever that joy was, it always resulted in quieting of the mind, and then you feel happy. Then you begin to let go of attaching unhappiness to people and things. You begin to see that the joy is only your very own self coming out more. But then when you see what this happiness is, you're not going to look for it where it isn't. And you reach the place where you need no one and no thing to be happy. You just are happy all the time. Is there any question on that? I guess intellectually it's, it's seen by everyone whether you see it through your own mind's eye or not, you should have it at first intellectually, then experiment with it, test it out, and you'll discover that this is so, that every time you feel happy, your mind is at ease. And that what you attributed to the person or thing outside of you or something going on within you, the quieting of your mind, so that your real self could shine forth more. <clears throat> then when you see this, you won't bog down anymore, because the moment you become unhappy, you'll know just where to go to reestablish the happiness. First recognizing that the happiness is not the person or the thing, but the quieting of the thoughts of desire for the person or thing, which allows you to just be more. When your mind is on things out there, you're not being. You're involved with externals. But I say the key is seeing just that point, mm -hmm. that your happiness is the quieting of your mind through the satisfying of desires which stills thoughts for the thing. When you actually see that in your own mind, you can do it directly. You can let go of those thoughts without achieving the person or the thing and immediately you're happy. But the overall thing is that you move toward happiness where it really is, in you, not in the externals. And in that way you establish a state of happiness that is continuous. Again, I say each one has to realize this for himself or herself. But when he or she does, then happiness be can be made permanent. Because then you look for happiness where it is, and you stop looking for it where it isn't. There is no happiness in people or things. Happiness is our basic nature. 
Happiness is our very beingness. And when we are only being, we are infinitely happy. When we are only being and nothing else, we are infinitely happy. It's knowing your infinite beingness that is eternal, it never changes, and that this whole world cannot touch you. It's just a fiction, a dream, and you move through life <coughs> with no attachments and no aversions. Then no one and no thing can disturb you. And you have this infinite peace and joy that's constant. Now, the only difference between a fully realized individual living in the world and one who is not is their attitude toward everything. Right. An unrealized person identifies with a single limited body mind. A realized person identifies with everything, every being, every atom. Therefore, getting joy out of everything that happens. No. Your very nature is joy. You don't get it out of everything that happens. Your basic nature is unlimited joy. This is your natural state. Therefore, as long as you don't uh, hinge it onto a person or a thing, it's there all the time. But if you say you can't have joy unless I do something, you limit your joy. Yes, I do. The natural state is unlimited joy. This is the real natural state. The natural state is being infinite. <clears throat> and we superimpose over that thing all these ideas of limitation, of needs, attachments, aversions, which block out this infinite joy that is natural. I thought maybe a summary of what we've been through where we're going and what there is at the end might be a good idea for the last talk of this series. I really don't know how we started, at what point, but the way I like to look at it is that everyone is seeking happiness full and complete with no taint of sorrow. That that happiness is our very own basic natural nature, which I call the self with a capital S. And because it's our basic natural nature, is the reason why everyone is seeking happiness. But in the end, we see that happiness with a capital H, God with a capital G, turns out to be the same thing. <clears throat> the mistake we all make is that we look for this happiness in people and in things. And it is not in people or things. The happiness or the pleasure that we feel is the eliminating of the pain of the desire or something, this desire is an original lack which we assumed. Being infinite beings, we never had any lack. We assume this lack, we create a desire for it. When the desire is fulfilled, our thoughts stop, and when our mind is still, our basic nature, the self, shines forth. The little things I've been saying and trying to accomplish have been trying to get you to see this yourself.
nothing should be accepted that I say nor that anyone else says until you can prove it out for yourself. The uniqueness of this science, which is a science, someday you'll see it's the science of all sciences, is that this is a subjective science. We have to uh, seek it within. We can't put it out on the table in front of us and examine it. We can only examine it within our own mind, within our own being. Also, the intellect does not avail it to us. The intellect can get us in the right direction to find it. And the right direction is by stilling the mind and by experiencing this truth, this knowledge. So only by experience can we get to know this. It is good in our daily life to be not the doer, be not the agent, just be the witness. It is not I but the Father who worketh through me attitude, which several in this group already have, is the main conduct of life that we should strive for. The more we become the witness in life, the more we become non-attached to the body, the more we become our real self. So there's two things I'm suggesting. One is the quest, who am I? And the second is, in life itself, be not the doer, be the witness. Let things happen. Allow it to be. Because that's the way we are in the final top state. And the best behavior in life is that which is characteristic of the top state. There are many other things which I'm sure you're aware of, of humbleness and so forth, goodness, kindness, honesty. <coughs> All these things help, but the greatest aid is be not the doer, be the witness. <coughs> All right, now when, when the self of us presents itself to us, it's a tremendous experience. It's a very difficult one to contain. We feel as though we're going to burst because we recognize our omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. But just seeing it once doesn't establish us in that state. However, once experiencing it, you'll never let go until you reestablish it. So you'll continue to try, and we should continue to try to get back into that state, the next time it'll last a bit longer, third time still longer, until finally we are in it 24 hours a day. When we attain this top state, we are not zombies, but we are all-knowing, everywhere present, everything falling perfectly into line without us. We move in the world just like anyone else moves, but the difference is we see the world entirely different from the way everyone else sees it. We see our body as our body, and we see every other body equally as our body. Every animal as we, everything. Now that seeing everything as I gives us that singular oneness throughout the universe, which is called God or the self.
we see our own body moving through life almost like an automaton. We sort of let it go its way. And since we are not that body, nothing that happens to that body can affect us. Even if we're crushed, disintegrated, it wouldn't mean a thing to us because we are fully knowing that we are not that body. We know our eternal beingness. So one who has attained the top state is difficult to distinguish from anyone else. He'll go through the same procedures of life, whatever he was doing before, he might continue to do. But his outlook on life is entirely different. He's, he's completely egoless. He has no concern for his own body. He is interested more in others than he is in himself. He is interested in all humanity. Whatever he does has absolutely no ego motivation. His body will continue to live its normal span in the eyes of those who are not fully understanding and usually goes out the same way most bodies go out via so-called death and coffin. But the one who was originally connected with that body never sees any of this death. He sees this entire world as an illusion that was created mentally, just as we create scenes, cities, and worlds in our night dreams. And when we awaken, we realize there never was such a thing. In the same way, when we awaken from this waking state, we see that the whole thing was a dream and never really was. That the only thing that ever was, was the absolute reality, infinite, all-perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent. Any questions on this? Do not be the doer. Don't you plan? Don't you do everything normally? Or is it bad? <clears throat> no. The right way is not to plan because everything's perfect. Let it happen. You'll be guided intuitively. Instead of planning up here, at the right moment, from moment to moment, you will do the exactly right thing, perfectly. There is a situation where somebody might take a position of that kind when he hasn't really felt it, and, uh, for example, saying, well, I'll just wait, I'll stay in bed until I moved. In the meantime, his rent isn't paid. So, he'll have to move. If, well, if we assume that we are there and we are not, we are soon awakened to the fact that we are not there. See? Bob, I'm putting out the top state now, the perfect state, where everything is in absolute harmony every moment. Then you never think, except this very moment. And at this very moment, you know from within just what is the right thing for you to do. So you're guided intuitively each and every moment, and everything falls perfectly into line. All right, now, if you're not there, of course you have to think. You have to plan. But this is the goal to strive for, the one that I'm speaking about. This is the top state. You're there. You don't have to plan. You can instantly materialize a palace of gold. Well, in practice, and probably in the beginning, a combination of the two where Things go very easily, and then sometimes you have a hump in which you plan. You plan it out, and then other things. I suppose that would be the practical yes. development. Use that which is available to you now. If, if we are in a thinking realm, of course, we have to think. Uh, 
but strive for this top realm. And striving for it, we will sooner or later attain it. Definitely, yes. In the top state, you do by knowing. You just know from moment to moment. It just feels like, an, I, I know it. That's just the way it feels. There's no thinking to it. I know it. But we, I know from my own experience, I slip back and uh, uh, lay out a plan. But sometimes that plan comes very easily and quickly to me, and other times I have to struggle like the devil to work it out step by step and I don't know what's going to happen or just, and other times I just lay out a plan and I know what's going to happen but I still lay the plan out but I know what's going to happen and I, I just I have no difficulty with it this is, this is what happens to me the word no as you use it is the key you know how that word feels when you say I know it there's no doubt, not one iota of doubt there, and it happens. That's the key. That's the realm of knowingness. Make that all the time. Just keep working for it until it comes. The uh, quickness in which we attain this is determined by the intensity of the desire for it. The more we desire this top state, the sooner it comes. Everyone makes it eventually. I'm convinced the majority of people on Earth today will probably take two million years, even more. But any one of us who are consciously seeking the way out can do it this lifetime. The so-called grace of God is always there also. <clears throat> All those who have made the top grade before us, with their consciousness of perfection being radiated to us, we have tremendous grace uh, being actually pushed our way all the time. However, they have no right to impose themselves. We have to open ourselves to it in order to receive it. We need this grace because of the state of affairs today. Man is relatively low. We are very strongly convinced that we are a limited body. And by long habit, we are trying to hold on to it. So it's not easy to let go of this body. And because of that, we need the grace of the great ones who in our eyes have passed on, but in their eyes they're still here. When we recognize that they're still here, we can see them and talk to them the way we talk to each other. Or if we accept them partially, we can talk to them in sort of a, a dream or a vision, or see them in the way in which they're transparent, you can see through them. But the way we meet with them is determined by our acceptance of them. If any one of us believed that we could go down to a restaurant here and have a cup of coffee with Jesus, the way you believe you could do it with me, if you had that much acceptance, then you could do it. Now, some of us know that he came into this room several times. He gave a sign uh, proportionate to our degree of acceptance. If he were to suddenly appear in the room, it would be too much for most of us to accept. Therefore, he doesn't. But the way he comes to us is determined by our acceptance of him. He gave signs here. He gave signs to some people here, and I don't think they even recognized that he gave a sign. But all the signs were not, say, like me touching you on the shoulder if I came over and touched you. It wasn't that way. But that's only because you 
can't accept that that could happen with him. The point I'm trying to make now is that we should open ourselves to the help of the great masters. Jesus wants to see each and every one of us know our perfection. He can't force it upon us. But his, his hand is always extended. It's good to keep this in mind. Then we open ourselves more to the help. And how do we request to receive this help? We have to do something to say. We have to be accepting of Jesus as being alive just as much as we are capable of meeting with you the way we meet with you then it can happen we have to be open to the help the help is always being sent to us are there words to say thoughts to carry yes But I can't give them to you. That's up to you. See, I give you the general principle, acceptance of him, the way he is. Don't expect him to be uh, not Christly, because he won't be that. However, he can appear as a very humble human being in form, being omnipresent. At any moment, he can appear to anyone and speak with them. After he will be as Christ, it won't be in disguise, will he? The beggar at the door? Or? No. The only disguise is the one that we put on him. He will never disguise himself. He wants to be recognized as Christ. And when I use the word Christ, I mean the principal Christ. That's not his name. His name is Jesus, the Christ. The man Jesus had the Christ consciousness. And we have to accept him in his consciousness which is extreme humility, simplicity, no Hollywood glamour. The divine humility? Yes. The greatest humility is through surrender. Not I, but thou. It is not I, but the Father who worketh through me. Everything I do is God God's work, I am not doing it. It's surrender of the ego. The ego being the sense of individuality. You've got to surrender yourself as an individual. And that's complete humility. Surrender yourself as an individual. How about the other person? Does that matter? Uh, saying, I think we mentioned once before, the other person we recognize as ourselves and we treat as though we were the same. But it, it, who is this other person and who am I? Why <coughs> the humility when we have all power? From where you stand now, the other person should not concern you. The only thing that should concern us is what we do. It matters not what your, your attitude is toward me. You could hate me with every cell in your body, but it's of extreme importance of what my attitude is toward you. While you're hating me, I should love you fully and completely. Then you'll understand the answer to all questions. See, when you separate and then ask what's up here, it just doesn't fit. But when we love and only love, we are using the most formidable power in the universe. No one and no thing can harm us. 
we can never ever be hurt unhappy if we would only just love without any hate never be hurt when you love. Now this is in the sense that the love is full, complete. It's divine love. It's just love with no, not one bit of hate in it. Turning the other cheek, giving the pants to match, loving your enemy, that's the kind of love it takes. And that's the way we all are, naturally, before we distorted this thing. And love is understanding. When you love, you understand the other one fully. It's understanding, it's by identifying with the other one, being the other one. Coming down a step, it's wanting the other one to have what the other one wants. Loving the other one the way the other one is. And who is our enemy? In reality, we have only one enemy, that's ourself. No one can do anything to us. No one can do anything for us. Someday you'll see this, that we in our consciousness determine everything that happens to us. And that's our idea of ourselves that is our... Right. Which is incorrect. Which could be made better. <laughs> yes? Uh, when you say understanding, do you mean uh, understanding in a logical sense uh, of understanding the things that them, or do you mean understanding in an acceptance of them uh, without without question of, of the reasons they're doing things as good or bad, just acceptance of whatever they are in, in an entirety? Yeah, it's acceptance in an entirety, but the real understanding requires uh, knowledge of what the universe and the world is. When we see someone doing wrong, we have to know that this is a, a God being misguided. He's looking for God in the wrong place when he's doing wrong. Am I making sense? Yes. That's the understanding. Which in his mind would be happiness. Right? He's looking for happiness the way he sees. Even a Hitler, in his mind, is doing right, and therefore should not be hated, but should be loved, wanting him to be what his real basic nature is. Now, this doesn't mean approving of his program, it doesn't. But whether we approve or not of his program, loving and hating are two different things than approving of a program. So we love everyone, see them as misguided beings, you know, forgive them for their know not what they do, they're like children, misguided. 